June 22, 1973. The first crew of Skylab astronauts returned safely to Earth. The three men had spent 28 days in Earth orbit, living and working aboard America's first space station. Following a mission debriefing period, the Skylab astronauts returned to Kennedy Space Center to thank the assembly and launch teams for their work. The astronauts, in turn, were praised for the mission's success, especially for their repair efforts in space. Astronauts Conrad, Kerwin, and Weitz had installed a sunshade and deployed a jammed solar panel on the orbital workshop. Their efforts made the space station operable and livable for themselves and for two following crews of astronauts who would live aboard the Sky Laboratory for longer periods of time. July 28th, a Saturn 1B rocket stood ready at Pad B of Complex 39 to launch the second crew of Skylab astronauts on their space voyage. An early morning launch was dictated by the orbital position of the space station and the time at which it would pass over Kennedy Space Center. The commander of the second Skylab crew was Alan Beam, a veteran astronaut who had walked on the moon during the Apollo 12 mission in 1969. Dr. Owen Garriott was science pilot for the mission. Jack Lausma was pilot. The three astronauts would spend 59 days, almost two months, working and living aboard the Sky Laboratory. About three hours before liftoff, the astronauts entered the command service module which would carry them to and from the orbital workshop. The countdown proceeded without any unscheduled delays. Engine ignition took place at 7.11 a.m. Within a few hours, the astronauts rendezvoused with the orbital workshop. Following a fly-around check of the space station and its Mylar solar shield, the men docked their spacecraft with the workshop. All three men experienced some dizziness, and motion sickness during their first days aboard the space station. The transfer from Earth's gravity to the weightless environment of the Skylab had been accomplished too quickly. On future missions, the astronauts would spend a day aboard their spacecraft before entering the Sky Laboratory. Another problem discovered during the first week in space threatened the success of the mission. A thruster engine in the command module was leaking fuel. This was the second thruster to develop a problem, and both thrusters had to be turned off. Without the thrusters, the astronaut's safe return to Earth was in jeopardy. At Kennedy Space Center, a rescue mode of assembly and launch operations was put into effect. An Apollo spacecraft, which could be used as a rescue vehicle, was checked out on an accelerated 24-hour, seven-day-per-week schedule. Skylab, was the first manned space flight program to have a rescue capability. It called for two astronauts to fly a five-seat spacecraft into Earth orbit, rescue the stranded crew, and return to Earth. The launch vehicle 
vehicle for the rescue operation, a two-stage Saturn 1B rocket was erected and checked out under a similar accelerated schedule. Within three weeks after the rescue mode was initiated, the rescue vehicle was moved to Pad B of Complex 39 and launch pad preparations were begun. While the rescue spaceship was being prepared, NASA and contractor personnel in several areas of the United States ran tests to determine whether the Skylab astronauts could return safely to Earth in the malfunctioning command module. Using an Apollo spacecraft simulator, technicians tested alternate methods of maneuvering the command module. They concluded that the three Skylab astronauts could safely fly their present spacecraft back to Earth. However, the rescue vehicle was maintained in a launch-ready mode in case any other serious problems developed aboard the orbiting space station. The continuation of their mission was welcome news to the Skylab astronauts who had become accustomed to their weightless environment. Work assignments were conducted with ease. The astronauts found they had extra time and requested flight planners to develop additional useful tasks for them to perform. One of the first major activities conducted by the crew was the installation of a twin pole solar shield above the parasol shield which had been deployed by the first Skylab crew. This provided a more permanent protection for the space station. Astronauts Jack Lousma and Owen Garriott worked outside the space station for six and one half hours, installing the sunshade and changing film in the Apollo telescope mount. The Earth's weather forecasting was given a big assist by the orbiting spacemen. We think we've got the uh, depression, uh, Houston. It looks like it's uh, just becoming, uh, uh, just being born out here in the uh, Gulf. It's uh, quite large, as you can see. It's right now it's obvious that, uh, that you can see uh, the, the structure and the size of the hurricane. We'll try to keep an eye on it for you. Uh, on a day-by-day -day basis, not only where it is, but how it's developing as far as size and intensity is concerned. During a second EVA, the astronauts installed new electrical connections outside the station. The connections were part of a gyro package, which the astronauts had brought with them on their trip up to the station. The new gyroscope replaced a faulty component used in the pointing and attitude control systems of the space station. During their 59 days in space, the astronauts conducted a long series of experiments. Working 12 to 16 hours a day, the men accomplished nearly twice as much scientific work as planned. The crew's most important scientific contribution may well be the mass of solar pictures and data gathered with the Apollo telescopes. Thousands of solar photos were taken, and more than 100 solar flares were studied. Two exceptionally large solar flares were observed. One of them expanded to over 17 times the diameter of the Earth. Under the direction of Garriott, a solar scientist by profession, the awesome event was photographed and measured from the first minutes of eruption. In all, the astronauts took over 100,000 pictures of the sun, stars, and Earth. Most of the Earth photos were taken as part of the Earth Resources Experiment. In 39 viewing sessions, 16,000 Earth photos were obtained for use in crop surveys, population growth studies, land use planning, and searching for natural resources.
Okay, we've just been looking. Here's our orbital map. Here's Africa. This has been our orbital path. The Sahel is an area that's about 500 miles in width, extending south from the Sahara. Here's the Sahara from the Atlantic to the Red Sea. This area right here is under an extreme drought condition now, caused by lack of rain for the last four or five years, or a minimum of rain for the last four or five years. Six nation area, and in that area, millions, several millions of people live. Now, from Skylab, we're not going to be able to make it rain. But we think from Skylab, we can look down with suitable sensors, photographs where you, we actually did just a few moments ago, look down with these sensors and find areas that are not so affected by the drought, that might not be obvious to a man on the ground. We also think we'll be able to determine areas which have high probability of water tables uh, not too distant below them. In other words, find spots that are, are, are good for possible digging of wells, for possible uh, planting of, of uh, crops where other plot, parts near, spots nearby aren't so possible. We think this will be possible on a worldwide basis, basis with equipment such as we're using in Skylab and with equipment such as we're using in our unmanned satellite Earth. A highlight in the experimental tasks accomplished by the men was the initial test of the backpack maneuvering unit. Alan Bean made the first flight. Switching to direct mode. He's backing off from the dining station. Rotating to his right, away from the TV camera. Okay. He wants to do it because that's the way he's done it before. He's got nice rotation going and a little translation. Right now he's shooting a little bit below San Joe. He's uh, got about half of his rotation about halfway there. He's uh, going to be uh, in attitude before he gets to the banjo, which is uh, no problem at all. Now he's stabilizing attitude. His feet are just passing uh, about five inches above the uh, food lockers. Coming up with the banjo. His toes are about to touch the dome lockers. Toes on dome lockers. Owen Jerry getting his on television. The backpack unit was designed to study the feasibility of such equipment or use outside a spacecraft on future missions. One of the more interesting experiments for the average person was submitted by a high school student. Can a spider spin a web in zero gravity? Well, this is the home of Arabella. At least the corner of it in which she decided to spin her web. I've got a close-up lens on here, so I can't show the full box that she's in actually about uh, three times the area shown in this view and she selected this corner in which to spin the web that you see here. She's been spinning these webs now for a little over two weeks almost every night and I'm not really certain that she changes it every night which is a usual pattern for uh, webs or for spiders on the ground as I understand it. Arabella succeeded in making a perfect web. Photographs of Arabella's web will be compared to webs produced by earthbound spiders. By the 40th day of the mission, routine medical checks indicated that the physical condition of the astronauts had stabilized. Erratic heartbeats and blood pressure had become normal, and weight losses changed to slow gains. The crew's physical improvement was at least partially due to a stepped-up program of exercises. But NASA doctors also suspect that the body may gradually adjust to weightlessness by itself. The mental attitude of the astronauts was good throughout the 59 days in space. Their appetite was very good. In fact, the crew consumed more food than was allotted for the second of three manned missions aboard Skylab. 
by mission's end, everything was working so well aboard Skylab that Commander Bean asked for a few days extension to the flight. His request was denied by mission control and the crew prepared to leave the orbital workshop. However, the success of the 59-day stay in space did prompt mission control to extend the third manned Skylab visit to an 85-day mission. The third crew was launched into Earth orbit in December 1973. As the second Skylab crew departed from the orbital workshop, they could look back with pride on their accomplishments. After a rough start with sickness and spacecraft problems, the second manned Skylab mission became one of the most successful scientific space endeavors. The crew had exceeded all scheduled requirements for the mission and accomplished nearly twice as much scientific work as planned. Skylab was fulfilling its objectives, providing reams of data and photos to answer many questions about the sun, the earth, and of man's ability to live in space for extended periods of time. Thank you.